Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. In the last video we had an introduction to important sampling and we learned how it is applied for sampling Lambert's diffuse BRDF on a spherical hemisphere. Today we are going to use it for sampling the hemisphere with the cook Turrent specular BRDF. We know this BRDF from the physically based rendering video, where I gave a high level explanation of these functions. To recap, this is the normal distribution function that determines what portion of microfacet normals happen to be facing in the same direction as the half wave vector, depending on the surface roughness. The half wave vector is the vector halfway between the view and light vectors. Here we use the Trowbridge red distribution function. The G function is the masking shadowing term, also known as the geometric function. It calculates how much of the incoming and reflected light is blocked by microfacets. In our implementation, we chose a variant of this function that combines these terms and also takes the height of the microfacets into account. This gives us the Smith correlated geometric function. Finally, we have the Fernell term, which determines how much light is reflected at grazing angles. Here we used the Schlick function. Also remember that the alpha parameter is the square of the perceptual roughness, which is a value between 0 and 1. Let's look at how we can evaluate this integral with the aid of important sampling. So here is the integral which we can write using polar coordinates, like we did for the diffuse BRDF. The theory of important sampling states that we can approximate this integral with this sum, for which we have to choose a probability density function. We know that the sum will become more accurate if p resembles f. Looking at the specular BRDF, we can see that the normal distribution function is the dominant term, so we can choose this part to be the PDF. However, d is a function of the half wave vector, so we have to use the angles with respect to this vector. Here, theta h is the angle between the half wave vector and the normal direction. Therefore, we can use cosine of theta h instead of n dot h. Substituting this in the PDF, we get this equation, which again depends only on theta. We know from the previous video that we can split the PDF into two functions that depend on each angle, where we can simply use 1 over 2 pi for p of phi. From this, we can derive p of theta. Next, we check if the integral of the PDF over the integration domain equals 1. This time we don't have to calculate any unknown constants. So we only check if the PDF that we chose meets this condition. And the answer is yes, it is equal to 1. I'll leave the evaluation of this integral as an exercise. It looks complicated, but in reality it's not hard at all if you know the integration by substitution technique. We can also solve the integral for some random theta between 0 and pi over 2. This will always return a random value between 0 and 1. Inverting this function will express theta h in terms of this random value. This is how uniform random values are mapped to the parameter space of the sum. Again, angle phi can be sampled uniformly. However, theta h now depends on surface roughness. I added this to the sample visualization program I made before. Here we see that the samples are more concentrated around the pole of the hemisphere for smoother surfaces. This makes sense since the distribution of light vectors converges to a smaller area for smooth surfaces. In fact, it will become a single point for a perfect mirror. In contrast, the sample will be much more scattered for fully rough surfaces. This is pretty much the same as the sampling pattern for the diffuse BRDF. Now looking at how we implemented the specular BRDF, we remember that we combined these terms and put them in the Smith correlated geometric function. So our integral is a bit simpler. Since the chosen probability density function is with respect to the half wave vector, we have to express this integral in terms of the half wave vector as well. 
we can do this by a change of variables. Here we take the derivative of d omega with respect to d omega h. This is a measure of how much d omega changes when d omega h changes. Calculating the primitive with respect to d omega h will revert this part again. And then we write the derivative part using polar angles theta and phi. We can see that there is a simple relation between theta and theta h when the view vector coincides with the normal direction. Remember that theta is the angle between the light vector and the normal, and is therefore twice as large as theta h, which is the angle between the halfway vector and the normal. Obviously, the orientation of the view vector has no consequence for the angle phi, so phi and phi h are the same. We can express theta in terms of theta h like this. Using a trigonometric identity, we can write sine of 2 theta h as 2 times cosine theta h sine theta h. Now all these terms cancel out and we are left with this integral. We can write the remaining d omega h using polar angles again. In addition, we can replace cosine of theta with n dot l and the cosine of theta h with v dot h. This is our final integral which we'd like to write as a discrete sum. We can divide this part by the probability density function. Again, these terms cancel out and we replace cosine of theta h by n dot h. This is the overall result of applying important sampling to this integral. Our aim is to write this sum to a texture as the prefiltering result. However, this expression both depends on the sampled cube map image as well as the view direction. This is obviously a problem since we can't prefilter the image for every possible viewing angle. One solution to this is to approximate the sum by splitting it into two sums. The most notable resource that almost everyone refers to when implementing IBL is a paper from 2013 by Epic Games called Real Shading in Unreal Engine 4. This solution is known as the split sum approximation, which splits the sum into a part that depends on the view vector and the surface roughness, and another part that depends only on the environment cube map. Of course, this is mathematically incorrect and doesn't give the same result as the original sum, but as it turns out, the error is fairly small and the result is visually plausible. Looking at the second part of the sum, we can see that this is really similar to what we did for the diffuse BRDF. It's just the average of sampled values on the hemisphere. However, this time we are using a different mapping from uniform random values. Now the mapping depends on the roughness value of the surface. Of course, we can't compute this average for every possible roughness value, but it is possible to do so for a few selected values. We saw that the sampling pattern becomes wider for higher roughness values, and that results in blurrier images as we would expect. Therefore, we can put the results for higher roughness values in smaller images since they contain less details. We can use the MIP levels of the resulting texture for this purpose. The first MIP level has the most detail and corresponds to a perfectly smooth surface. The following MIP levels contain the results for increasingly higher roughness values. When applying the pre-filtered results for image-based lighting to a pixel with a roughness value that doesn't exactly match one of these MIP levels, we'll linearly interpolate between the two MIP levels with closest roughness value. Fortunately, this can be done automatically using bilinear sampling, as we'll see in the next episode. Note that we are sampling the source cube map using a fixed view vector that coincides with the normal direction. Using the random theta and phi angles, we can vary the halfway vector, and by extension the light vector, which is used for sampling the cube map. Implementing this in shader code is now fairly simple. We have a function that constructs a half-way vector from random values and the roughness. Parameter a is the fourth power of the perceptual roughness. The prefiltering method is similar to the one we wrote for diffuse prefiltering. As I mentioned, the view vector is the same as the normal direction. 
and because of this we will get a larger error at grazing angles as we can see here. In the for loop we generate random numbers, use those along with the roughness value to construct the half way vector, and then transform it to a coordinate system of which the normal direction is the z axis. We calculate the light vector, which is the reflection of the view direction over the half wave vector. Finally, we use the light vector to sample the source cube map, but only if the sample is above the surface. Also, note that we are multiplying each sample by n.l. Furthermore, instead of dividing the result by the number of samples, we divide by the sum of all dot products. So effectively, we are evaluating this expression instead of the one we derived using our beautiful mathematics. This is also the way it's done in Unreal Engine and Frostbite Engine, which also closely follows this pre-filtering method. There is no mathematical derivation for this and it's empirically determined such that the resulting image better matches the ground truth. And this is all for the part that depends on the environment image. The other part depends only on the view vector and the roughness value. Therefore, we only have to calculate it once and it can be reused for all images. The sum contains the Fresnel function and the correlated geometric function. Combining some terms in separate variables, we can rewrite this sum like so. In the literature, it's often called the DFG sum. Recall from the PBR episode that F0 is the specular color of the material and F90 is the specular color at grazing angle. These values are known when we render a material, so all we have to do is to calculate these two sums and put the result in a lookup texture. Each sum has two inputs, which are the roughness and the cosine of the angle between the view vector and the normal direction. We can store the results in the red and green channels of a texture in a half-precision floating-point format. Here we can see what this texture looks like. We will not implement this part of the specular pre-filtering in this episode, since I have to set up the editor to handle default assets like this that only get generated once. But we can already have a look at the shader code, which is again similar to what we have seen so far. The first parameter is the cosine of the angle between the view vector and the normal vector. This is the UV coordinate of the lookup texture in the horizontal direction, which is a value between 0 and 1. Roughness is the UV coordinate in the vertical direction. First, we get the view vector from n.b using a bit of trigonometry. In the for loop, we generate random numbers using the Hammersley function and construct the half wave vector from the random numbers and the roughness value using these relations. Again, the light vector is calculated by reflecting the view vector over the half wave vector. In order to evaluate the geometric term, we need n.l, n.h, and v.h. If the light vector is above the plane, then we calculate the geometric term and the two sums. After the for loop, we divide the results by the number of samples and return the values. As we'll see later, the value of A will be written to the red channel and B to the green channel of the lookup texture. We won't compress this texture in order to preserve its precision. So now we have pre-filtered the original cube map, which resulted in three parts. The diffuse pre-filtered, specular pre-filtered, and the BRDF integration lookup textures. As I mentioned, we create this lookup texture only once, since it doesn't depend on the environment cube map. These textures contain all the data that we need in order to calculate the lighting from the environment at any pixel that we are rendering. This is the same as evaluating this equation, which is largely pre-calculated during pre-filtering. All we have to do now is to sample from each texture, multiply the diffuse and specular colors of the material with their corresponding sampled values, and add everything together. Here we see a basic implementation of the shader code. Like I said, we sample from the diffuse cube map using the normal vector at the current pixel and multiply the sampled value by the diffuse color of the material. The specular part consists of the specular cube map and the BRDF lookup texture, so we sample those as well. 
Remember that the specular cube map has MIP levels that correspond to increasing values of perceptual roughness. In our implementation, we have six MIP levels, so multiplying the roughness by five will sample from the correct pair of MIP levels using bilinear sampling. Since each pixel in the BRDF lookup texture corresponds to a specific combination of view vector and roughness value, we can use these as UV coordinates to sample from the texture. The specular pixel color is then calculated by simply adding these terms. As we know from the PVR episode, specular color is the F0 term and we can approximate F90 by setting it to 1. To get the final pixel color, we add the diffuse and specular parts together and return it. This was all the theory behind image-based lighting. If you'd like to watch another video that explains this topic really well, feel free to watch this one, which helped me a lot to understand the mathematics. We are going to look at pre-filtering the specular cube map in the next video. However, we are not going to do the BRDF lookup texture part just yet. Since this is a default asset, we also have to set up the editor for generating default assets at startup. Therefore, I moved implementing this part to the next episode, where we also finalize IBL implementation, so we can move on to the next topic in the game engine programming series. Before wrapping up, I'd like to show the result of lighting the scene using four different environment maps. I hope you enjoyed watching this video and maybe learned something new about important sampling and image-based lighting. As always, thank you for joining me and I'll see you next time.